Welcome to the Emerging Civil War Podcast. I'm Chris Mikowski, and joining me is my friend Sal Salella, who is a columnist for Civil War News, writes about the graphic war. And I wanted to bring him on the podcast today to talk a little bit about what the graphic war is and why it provides really a fascinating insight into how we understand the war today. Sal, welcome. Thank you. It's nice to be here. It's a pleasure and an honor. It is. I a, love a to pleasure. talk about prints. The pleasure is 19th mine. century prints, yes. <laughs> it was a big deal. Like the, the printmaking business was a huge deal back then. Uh, there, There's an author whose name escapes me right now who has written a book up on, on prints. I've got a ton of those. Uh, but he uh, he said the Civil War was good for printmakers. And boy, was that the truth. Um, the uh, the, the uh, boon in, in the need or the desire to see news, which is fascinating because they started out by doing single sheets that were newsworthy. The big explosion, you know, on the Lexington steamer in 1841 or something like that. Uh, or they, they do uh, prints of uh, fires, the Chicago fire later in 1871, of course, after the war. But uh, they often uh, wanted to encapsulate current events and make the prints newsworthy as opposed to decorative. But that, so that that objective changes over time. People start looking at these as actual decorative arts as opposed yes, to just yes. Of yes. And and the uh printmakers were uh much above uh patriotism. They were after profit and they they made money wherever they could make it and sold whatever uh, groups they could make. Uh, Courier knives made a lot of prints for the immigrants that were coming over. Irish, Catholic, Italians, and 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 Germans especially. So uh, they catered to the different demographics as they saw them come in. And there, there's a lot of sappy, <laughs> but uh, uh, supposedly sacred uh, prints that were made for hanging on the wall as decorative pieces. And uh, interestingly, later in the war, after the war, there were a lot of prints made in the North uh, to uh, further the lost cause. So they could sell to the markets in the South, which had no printmakers whatsoever after the war. They were they were pr pretty much decimated, but uh, they were making prints of uh, Stonewall Jackson and Robert E. Lee that as one author has said, they, they transplanted the pictures of Jesus on the walls. Mm, yeah. Uh, I, I've seen oh. a picture of the the Holy Southern Triumvirate, which is Jesus, Robert E. Lee, and Elvis Presley. You know, and I sort of <laughs> I've like not seen that one. <laughs> <laughs> no, same, I haven't seen that one. Same company. Um, so I, I'm I'm trying to wrap my head around this. Like, so people would buy these big sheets with a picture on it of a yeah. news of a news item and yeah. hang it on the wall. Yeah. Um, why was that a thing? Why was that what? Why was that a thing? Why did people think like, oh, let's put this news story on? Well, the they, I guess the, the need to know, and that's been supplanted by social media today. I mean, it was it was quick. It was the quickest form of of uh, information that was transferred in you could imagine in the nineteenth century. Now we have instant instant gratification, instant notification. So uh, that's what got me interested in it because why would people want to do this? Some of the stuff is so sappy and sentimental but that fits in with the victorian period very nicely so what did it take to create one of these prints walk us through the process oh my god uh that's that is quite the process most of the prints that i talk about are lithographs and lithographs were made on a very very uh, uh stable and heavy stone uh, therefore the term litho stone from the Greek litho, and it's a graph. It's a graphic piece of work, and uh, it was it was prepared. the 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 stone was prepared, and ink was placed on it, and so was uh, wax. And wax and ink do not mix, so the ink would form the picture, and the wax would keep the ink from going where the artist didn't want it to go. And so when this picture was all made, it took forever to make these things because they had to polish the stone first, which took a lot of time. Once that was done, a piece of paper was laid on top of the stone and pressed into it and then ripped off. And there was your there was your 
uh, print or your image backwards. Actually, they had to do it backwards uh, on the uh, on the stone. Mm -hmm. Now, that that was lithography, but there was also wood engraving, which was which Harper's Weekly and London Times and and all of those papers, Frank Leslie's, they used woodcuts, and these were little wood blocks made of a special kind of wood, and they would be carved by the woodmaker by the printmaker after the uh, uh, the artist would paint the picture or draw the picture on the top of the, of the wood and they were they were about four inches by four inches and they were they were ganged together and if you look at a, a print from Harper's Weekly today you can see the lines between where the the uh, those uh, ob those blocks of wood came together instead it, of a, a single like uh, eight by 16 block. Yeah. It's yeah. actually a bunch of small blocks that they put together. That's right. And, and so That's like right. a puzzle piece, right? And 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 it was it was printed in the same the same way as that you put a piece of paper on it after you inked it. That was the easiest way to do this. You it just inked it and you put the piece of paper on it and it came out. And they could run several of these and then you keep inking it. So uh you get different gradations when you look at some of the Harper's Weekly. Some are very clear and crisp, as we say, and others were really bad because they've been overly used. There was a third me method of, of printing and that was engraving, which came in uh, at the, about the same time. Uh, and engraving was exactly what it says it was. It took a piece of, of copper or steel and you engraved it just like you would a, a, a ring or a, a, you know, a, a watch or anything like that. They engrave what you wanted to write. And of course that was all backwards too. So they had to print backwards in order to print forward. <laughs> you follow me. <laughs> uh, your recent column talks about uh, sort of this uneasy alliance between the artists and the printmakers. Um, yeah. You know, they need each other, but there's yeah. some tension in that relationship too. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, uh, they didn't have any control until later when laws came into effect to of, of safeguarding their work. And so they, uh, they, they didn't like to produce things they didn't get credit for. It was as simple as that. But the printmakers had no laws to, uh, to guide them or to prohibit them from stealing from others. So they, they would do that. They would also take old plates and re-up them. And I just finished uh, uh, another one uh, on, uh, a printmaker by the name of uh, Waterman Lily Ormsby. Do you love the name? <laughs> W.L. We call him W.L. This guy was an engraver, and he engraved uh, prints, but also started out by uh, coming up with a machine that would engrave on Colt pistols. Mm -hmm. And that's where he started. He made it, he, he invented a machine that would engraved the cylinders on the Colt. And he did them for several of Colts. Uh, and, and sometimes you can find his name on a Colt. Well, he, he, he was somehow in, infatuated with Franklin Pierce, our one time president. And uh, he, he did a, an engraving of Franklin Pierce in the Mexican War, and it's entitled Major, Franklin, Major General Franklin Pierce. And there he is on his horse and, and background of, of Mexican War uh, vignettes uh, on either side of his horse. And later, what, uh, and this is a, another case of, a, of a, an artist reusing old materials. When George McClellan became the head of the Union Army, he took the same print and he took Pierce's face off of it and put McClellan's face on it and retitled it, but it gets better. He retitled it, uh, Major. it was a Major General George McClellan, head of the Union Army, something like that. Or it was just Major General, that was it. It was just Major General George McClellan. <clears throat> and then it was obviously done in late 1861 or early 62, because as we all know, McClellan got the ax in November of 62, but he, he did another one. And this one said, late Major General George McClellan. <laughs> and so with printmakers or print collectors, that first one that he did, not the Pierce one, but the first one is a very rare one 
and it's called a first state. They, they, and the second one's called a second state, obviously. But here's where an artist is just taking all kinds of liberties, if you will. Yeah. yeah. And so, the, the real tension came in, I think, more so between lithographers and photographers, because photography slowly was ascending as the new technology. And you can see the, the changes in the, and I've done the last three or four columns on this, on this changeover, on this usage of photography to enhance lithography. And, and you think about those competing technologies, uh, yeah. was there was there room in the marketplace for both of those at that time or? Um... At that time there was, but it gradually overtook it. And so the, the, uh, the hallmark date is 1907 when Courier and Ives went out of business. No more lithography from them. I mean, others did, did lith lithography, but some of it, was uh, photolithography, and some of it was photogravure, which is photogravure is nothing more than changing a mechanical process for the hand 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 done process that I explained earlier. So they had te technology on technology, and it just it's a, fi a fascinating example of how we went from. I think the first lithograph came out in eighteen thirty seven or something at that. At, I, I can't remember the exact date. But uh, it pretty much ended a, a century later in 1907 when Courier and Ives collapsed. And uh, there were some still around, um, but that was pretty much the end of it. You mentioned Courier and Ives. Were there other uh, houses that did lithographs? Uh, oh my God, there was some of them, yeah. None were as, as popular though. Uh, the Kellogg's were a, a good example of that in Connecticut. They produced a lot of stuff during the war and afterwards, and then there were others, uh, a, a guy by the name of Kelly. Uh, in the 1930s, there was a huge resurgence of collecting courier knives and, and American lithographs. And a fellow by the name of Frederick Fred Peters wrote a huge tome, actually four volumes, about that thick, on uh, American lithographers and, and courier knives prints. And one of the volumes just dealt with all of the other lithographers other than Courier and Ives. And it must be 900 pages. So in answer to your question, I have no idea how many. There were tons of them. And most of them, and this is another thing that I've learned in writing this column, is that most of them, not all, but a lot of them were German immigrants. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of... Uh, Controversy, as you well know, right now today about immigration and immigration policy. Well, they added and contributed in a tremendous amount of uh, work and good work. Some of it was was not so good, but uh, most of it was pretty good. And they did a lot for the uh, the market, and they did a lot for the business and the economy. Uh, a lot of them were emigres from the eighteen forty eight revolutions taking place in Europe. So, uh, yeah, and, and we, we, you know, as Civil War folks tend to think of, of these images and we see them used in, in, in books and things like that. Um, how important are those for our understanding of the Civil War? Some of them are very important because the title margins will tell you a lot about what's going on and give you some, what I would call primary source information. The title margin being the the margin at the bottom of the of the print, and and its definition. Others <laughs> are garbage. And give you a a real good example of that are the small what they call the small folio courier and knives, mm -hmm. prints of all the battles, the Battle of Williamsburg, the Battle of Gettysburg, the Battle of Spotsylvania, the Battle of Antietam. You wouldn't know that that was the battle unless you read the title margin. <laughs> They're all alike. And right. I've never written about them and I never will. And I never collected them because they're useless. I mean, they would slap on a, a, a battle scene that could have been anywhere and they call it whatever they wanted to call it. Okay. So some of them are very, very, very useful. Some of them are totally useless. And I think about those particularly ones you're talking about, and they've got a very definite style to them. Would it oh. have been one artist doing it, or would there have been a team that was working to a house style? Oh, that's or... a great question. That's a great question. It, it, it would be one artist, and for the small folios, an unknown artist. 
And, and what they did, <clears throat> they hired young women who would then take the black and white print as it came off of the lithographic stone and it dried, of course, and they would they were in a, an assembly line and they would give the print in black and white to these, these women who would be called colorists. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Excuse me. And one colorist would do green, one would do blue, one would do yellow, one would do red and on and on down the line. Now, <clears throat> those are the garbage ones. They also employed some very, very fine artists and used those fine artists work to reproduce them as prints. And I'm thinking of famous artists and the most famous artist I can think of is Winslow Homer, who's well known to everybody. And you know, in, in, in Harper's Weekly, he did a ton of, of prints of battle scenes and fabulous, uh, you know, the sharpshooter, which I wrote about a couple times ago. And uh, there were others like Freeman Johnson, who was a, uh, one of the founders of the Metropolitan Museum of Art and a great artist did, did uh, genre uh, arts and it, it, some of the stuff is exquisite. There was also, and I've written about her too, I love talking about Fanny Palmer. Fanny Palmer was a New York artist who was employed by Courier and Ives, mainly for the, uh, her ability to paint beautiful landscapes. Besides war scenes, she did a lot of landscapes. I have two in my collection that are a combination of, of civil war and landscapes that Fanny Palmer did. One is in the Shenandoah Valley and the other one is in uh, another, it's near, the, near, the, near Harper's Ferry, but it shows a, an idyllic landscape. And if you look closely at it, in, in, that in, that in, in the interior of that classical landscape are tents after tents after tents, white tents of soldiers. It's a, it's a union camp yet it's enveloped in this beautiful landscape that she would do. And, and she'd go up and down the Hudson and she did a lot of views of the Hudson, including West Point, which I love collecting. So yeah, yeah you, the artists were, were fascinating. Uh, one of them was William Fitz, Fitzwilliam Tate and Tate is well known in the art world uh, as a painter of uh, uh, Western art. And he did a lot of Indians and cowboys and and settlers and, and trappers and pioneers, killing Indians, as a matter of fact. But regardless, that, that was the thing at the time. It's interesting, you know, as you talk about the different artists and, and what they've done and, you know, thinking about the impact that that has had on our collective conscience um, and, yeah. and it's influenced the way we think about the West, the way we think oh, yeah. about some of these landscapes. Um, you know, Courier Knives defined Christmas for so many people, you know. And Thomas Nass did it even more so in the, in the uh, uh, Harper's Weekly. Yeah, uh, we, we get a very skewed image of how we treated indigenous peoples uh, in, in, in the westward movement. And, and I, it's, these are hard to talk about, but they also, Courier and I did a lot of very negative black stereotypical <clears throat> prints that are our, our best uh, kept in, in private institutions rather than for, for research purposes. Uh, but they were, they were horrible, horrible black images. So you've referred to or, or referenced your personal collection a couple of times. What yeah. got you interested in collecting? Oh. <laughs> well, I, 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 my, my dad was a doctor and he went to a medical meeting driving with three other, four other doctors from our home. We grew up in, I grew up in South Bend. I was born in Chicago, but grew up in South Bend, Indiana. And uh, these guys drove back from Baltimore to South Bend and they went through Gettysburg. And he picked up one of those, and you, you're familiar with it, those blue and gray pamphlets that they used to sell, those little booklets for a quarter. Picked up the one on Gettysburg and he brought it home. He said, here, I was like 15 years old. He said, here, I think you might be interested in this. Well, that ignited the flame. And I think, I don't know how I got involved in prints, but they were reinforced when I was in museum school in Cooperstown, New York. The head of the uh, 
uh, New York State Historical Association, who I worked for, I was his assistant, uh, collected prints. And he had them all over his house, his gorgeous, you know, 19th century house on the uh, on the banks of the Shenandoah River. <laughs> uh, no, excuse me, the Susquehanna River. It starts out in, in uh, Cooperstown off of Lake Oxego. Well, you know, my wife and I looked at each other and said, what a great way to decorate the house. <laughs> <laughs> so we started collecting again. But I started when I was younger. I think the first print I bought was a Courier and I's print of John Adams. I don't know whatever happened to that. I guess I probably sold it when I needed it. But when I was in college and, and in uh, in grad school, I used to haunt the uh, antique stores and, and bookstores and all well, the stuff you could find. You still can, but I mean, you picked up stuff for ten, five, fifteen dollars, as much as you could afford on a graduate student's uh, uh, stipend. Right. But that's how I started, and uh, now now it's all all full of the, the the house is full yeah yeah and how, like, how do you how do you store all that i mean that's got to be a logistics issue i've got a if you see can you see the print cabinet back there yeah yeah, yeah I've just got poking up above it's your... got eight it's got eight drawers in it and some of them are full some of them have 121st material in them some of them have upton material in it but you look over my shoulders that famous one by batchelder of gettysburg which mm -hmm. is in pristine condition and above that is uh Sherman before Savannah by Boddicker with all his troops. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, there, there we go. There's yeah. the prints. Ah, ooh, look you at that. See, and I got broadsides. Yeah. I love broadsides. I've not written about them. So it's, I was actually thinking, you know, when I do a lot of these interviews, people are, you know, in front of their bookshelves and then, you know, people like to show off their collections. And I was admiring your low bookshelves along the wall to obviously yeah. make room for the prints and, and broadsides yeah. on the walls there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Pretty cool. It's a neat collection. Yeah, the next room is loaded with books. And that one you can't see. <laughs> yeah. I didn't haul the computer in there, but <laughs> that's what I, I rely on. But you asked an interesting question earlier about how I choose an, a, a print. Yeah. And how I get it. But I started doing, because I work with Jack Melton at the Civil War News, we usually try to get prints that have uh, images from the Library of Congress because they're easily uh, reproducible. So I start out with that. And sometimes when I can't find what I'm looking for, I'll get it from somewhere else. But uh, if they'll let me use the picture. But we've been pretty lucky in, in the, that the Library of Congress has a lot of stuff, as you can imagine. They don't have it well organized. And <laughs> if you may have noticed. Yeah, spot on you, there. <laughs> yeah, if, you've never, if you've ever been there, oh my God. But anyway, uh, that's how I start. And I find a print that, that intrigues me. And then I begin looking at who the artist was, who the printmaker was, who the publisher was, what the topic is talking about. So I can write about all those things in a column. I mean, it just falls in naturally after a while because you can give added, you can give uh, equal time, I should say, to uh, the artist, the printmaker, the times, what this print is reflecting in, you know, what's going on with the war uh, or, or write about it afterwards like I did. I think I did one on Stonewall Jackson where, as I said before, uh, many of the uh, homes replaced Jesus with Stonewall Jackson, which is a real telling thing when you're talking about the lost cause. Yeah. And that to me is a fascinating period. Yeah, yeah. One of the so things too, that, that, that I think is kind of neat that you do, and you know, the way that some people today will watch a Civil War movie and they'll nitpick about this bit of historical accuracy or that factualness. And the same thing goes on with those prints where there's a degree of accuracy and a degree of inaccuracy for artistic license. Absolutely. Well, you got to remember they're artists and there is artistic license and there's poetic license. The guy who got it better than anybody, I think, is Batchelder when he did Gettysburg, that Gettysburg print. He's, and he spent his whole rest of his life <laughs> studying the Gettysburg battlefield. So he's, he's got it correct. So is there um, a particular print in your collection that you just is your crown jewel? Yeah. Uh, it's a courier. And it's not Civil War. Uh, it's fascinating. It's what they call large folio, which is what this batch elder is. And it's a it's called the Port of New York in 1872 and by Courier. Courier did three states of this print. 
state one, state two, state three. I've got the first state in 1872. He did it again in 1876 for the centennial. And then he did it 20 years later in 18, I think it was 1886. Right, the first one was 72, so this would have been 92 with the port of New York showing the Eiffel, uh, the Eiffel Tower, the Statue of Liberty. Oh. So I've got the first folio, or the first state of that thing, and that is the crown jewel. I mean, wow. you just don't see that. Some prints are scarce, but this is rare. Yeah. You know. I, I want to back up just a second to, to yeah. that when you talked about writing for the uh, for Civil War news. Yeah. Um, and how did you go from collecting to deciding to write about these? Well, I, I got my copy of the Civil War news one one week, and, and I thought, you know, they ought to do some stuff about a, about a New York about uh, 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 American. Civil War prints, because uh, I've been collecting Civil War prints. I've been sort of focusing on that for the last few years. And uh, so I called Jack and I said, how about a column on that? I could do it. And and I said, I'd like to call it the graphic war. He said, fine. <laughs> Just like that. <laughs> so, you know, at first it was sporadic, but now I do one every month. Yeah, yeah. And I'm up to April already. I, uh, I It's a, a column I look forward to because, you know, there's just such a nice reproduction of something that, that's yeah. large enough that you can really study and look at and examine and, and, and kind of that's the beauty of getting them from the library of congress yeah 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 he can blow those up and they can be really uh, easily readable as they say so as if i'm someone who wants to learn more about civil war prints um what advice would you offer to someone who wants to explore this topic a little more there are three books by Harold Holzer, <laughs> going back to Harold. Harold is the fountain of all information on this. He did one with uh, two other guys. Uh, he did all three of them with other people, but we'll just stick with Harold. Uh, he did one on the Lincoln image. He has done more research and writing and uh, intellectual stimulation on the prints of, uh, that were done of Lincoln both as he was becoming uh, a nominee and as, when, as he became president and all through his presidency and then his, his assassination and then all the tributes after that. So he's got one book on the Lincoln image. He's got one book on the Union image, which deals with Union uh, uh, lithographs primarily, but he does talk about other art and then the Confederate image. So those are twins. Those three books to me are the, the touchstone. And then from there, you can spread out to, to others. I've got a whole bunch of different ones that, that I refer to every once in a while. And uh, there's one whole book on Fanny Palmer, for example, I mentioned her earlier. And uh, there's one book on Charles Magnus. Magnus produced a lot of these very small prints of different, uh, different uh, uh, cities and town views that are collectible. Uh, but uh, you were asking about others, you know, there, there are thousands of other lithographers who, who, who printed these things, but I'd start with those three books and uh, go from there. And I think it's worth noting too, that the library of Congress, uh, as you say, kind of hard to find things sometimes, but mm -hmm. their collection is scanned at such a high resolution that if you download them, you can really look at them up close and see yeah. the, the incredibly fine detail in some of these pieces of yeah. art. Yeah. Yeah. You could, you should, you should, Listening, if you're listening to this now, you should go try it out. It, you can get different uh, resolutions, you know, higher and higher. Really beautiful. And it's it's well done. Um, I want to shift gears just for a second, Sal, because I want to give you a chance to talk a little bit about the great work you've done on Emory Upton, which oh. was a little different than your graphic war. But um, you and I are both sort of uh, Upton fans, and you yes. are certainly yeah. one of the great Upton experts. Um, tell us a little bit about what you have done about uh, – our favorite guy from Batavia, New York. Well, I've been very fortunate in getting a hold of his papers in, in a thousand different places, including the Library of Congress. That was an interesting thing. I went to the Library of Congress to get my uh, letters uh, on Emory Upton. So I asked for the file on Emory Upton and they brought it to me. It was one letter in the file, one letter. Oh my. And I asked for the Garfield papers and there they were. There were tons and tons, because he had a long correspondence with Garfield. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah, it was Garfield. That's right. Anyway, uh, 
I got started on it when I was in graduate school at Cooperstown in the museum program. We were required to write a, a uh, master's thesis on either museums, folk life, or history. And I said, well, I'll, I'll do history. Let me do Civil War history. And I started looking around because this, the school year was only a year at that time. They've expanded now. But you had less than six months to do some research right there on site. And I discovered there was a whole bunch of research there for a Civil War regiment known as the 121st New York Volunteer Regiment. And I thought, well, this is great. I only have to go to Albany to get a little more. And I can get a lot of the information right here in Cooperstown because a lot of the information was there. It also up in Herkimer in Mohawk, which is right up there. You know the area up there. You're up there now. And um, so I thought I will write my master's thesis on the 121st New York, which I did, which was looking back on it now, the most pitiful thing I've ever done. <laughs> but I said to my wife, who who typed it fourteen hundred times, you remember the remember when you used to do your thesis on a piece of paper that had red lines on it? Ah. Did you ever have that? No, you had but I... to have everything inside the red lines, including the footnotes at the bottom, yeah. and if it didn't fit, you had to retype it. I mean, it was it was unbelievable. This not modern technology is fabulous. Anyway. Uh, uh, we, I told my wife, someday I want to write a history of the 121st. And when I got back to the museum field, because I was a, a museum director for an art museum, and I worked at the Smithsonian for six years raising money, and I didn't do any research uh, at that time. But I did after I got back to the Indiana Historical Society, and I started doing more research. And it took eight years to pull all the research together with a few breaks along the way, which were very helpful and too long to explain here. But uh, so I wrote my hundred, the book of the 121st came out in 2009. And I got to thinking about Emory Upton and all the papers that I'd seen, I'd seen his, his, his work that was, uh, that Peter Mickey died, did uh, a couple of years after Upton died. And I started with that because he printed a lot of them, but a lot of them he didn't print and a lot of, and, and a few of them he actually, uh, shall we say, enhanced, <laughs> or he printed them in his Life and Letters of Emory Upton. And so I started on this uh, trail of finding all of the papers I could ever find on Emory Upton, which I finally did. It took me eight, eight more years. These things take a long time. They do. You know, I finished my last one uh, when I was a student. I was trying to find this original document, and I finally found it in the, in the uh, Herkimer Democrat, which I turned uh, into, it was a memoirs of, of one of the privates, uh, DeWitt Clinton Beckwith. And I just turned that into his memoirs. It was published by McLean, uh, McFarland, excuse me, McFarland uh, and Company just in, in May. And um, I was looking for that thing forever. And when I found it in the paper, it, would, it had been published as 53 installments in the paper. Oh, wow. And uh, uh, that was a real keystone to getting the book going with the uh, with Upton and the 121st. So it's all over the ballpark. It's a fascinating uh, journey. I've, I've had a great time. Yeah, great. Now, but the funny thing I tell you about it, it, you know, it took eight years to do this one. It took eight years to do this one. Now I finished this last one. That's where I was going with this story. When I finished this last one, people say, well, now what's your next What's your next book? And I said, I don't know if I got another eight years. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really, that's incredible. Uh, well, for those of us who are uh, Upton fans, uh, you know, your work, um, your time was well spent. Your work Thank has you. just been fantastic. And uh, Interesting guy, isn't he? He is. He's fascinating. For folks who don't know, Emory Upton came from Batavia, New York, uh, um, kind of a hot shot out of West Point, uh, yep. really you know, throws himself into the fire at Second Fredericksburg. He's probably best known for yep. the assault at Spotsylvania Courthouse. But just his post-war career is is one of the most consequential that the Army ever had the, the opportunity to benefit from. You know, that's interesting because it took two volumes to do his his work, to do his correspondence. And the second volume is is covers only like five years or six years. I can't remember which. And it's it's j just as jam packed as the first ones. 
first year during the Civil War when he wrote to his parents and his uh, his sisters. Yeah, so a consequential figure in the history yeah. of the United States Army. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Sal, I appreciate you taking the chance to uh, talk with us a little bit today and share oh, some of your passion with us. That was just a great little uh, trip through your collection. <laughs> Come back again. I'll take you through the rest of it. <laughs> Fantastic. Sal Salilla, thanks for being with us today on the Emerging Civil War Podcast. I'm Chris Mikowski. Thanks for being with us. We'll see you online and on the battlefield. Okay, guy. Take care. Good luck. <laughs>